Um, all right, so we're going to talk about boundaries. So first of all, what are boundaries? So boundaries are limits that we set to protect what we care about. So often we think of boundaries as keeping things out of our life, but really they're keeping what's really important in our life. Uh, and they're not just about saying no, but they're actually about saying yes to something. So just for an example, let's say uh, you decide to get married. When you get married, you say yes to your spouse, but by saying yes to them, you're actually saying no to every other person. Or for example, if you want to recover, uh, you're saying yes to recovery, but that also means saying no to a lot of activities. So often we feel deprived sometimes when we think about boundaries, but we have to think that we're not giving something up just you know, for the sake of giving something up, that we're actually protecting something that's important to us. Um, so boundaries are definitely a huge issue for recovery. For, so for people who are trying to overcome addictions, we need all sorts of boundaries in order to stay sober from, you know, whether that be drugs and alcohol or a sexual addiction, a gambling addiction, a shopping addiction. There are things that we're going to have to restrict ourselves from. Uh, the other issue with boundaries, though, is that we talk a lot about complex trauma. And the thing with trauma is that affects every aspect of our life, and a huge area is our ability to set boundaries. Uh, so often, if we grew up in an unhealthy family, then we were not allowed to have boundaries. Our boundaries could be stepped on, or if there was abuse, they were violated. Um, often, other people in the home did not have boundaries, and so we were not taught. Uh, the other issue is that when there's a lot of boundary violation in a home, it actually creates confusion about where we start and end and where the other person starts and end. So we can be confused about if our mom's angry, is that because I'm bad? Did I hurt her? You know, am I wrong? Do I deserve to be punished? As opposed to realizing that someone else could be acting out of their own pain. Uh, sometimes we're confused about responsibility. So we can have children that grow up having to take on adult roles, even though that wasn't really their job. Uh, the other issue with growing up in an unhealthy home is that often, uh, if we wanted to set a boundary, we had to do something unhealthy to set that boundary. So for example, if no one would listen or we were getting hurt, often eventually people actually get aggressive themselves in order to set a boundary. Uh, another thing people sometimes do is have to completely isolate. So in other words, if they couldn't set a boundary with the people around them, they decide to just leave, go somewhere else, be alone, and that's how they could have a boundary. Um, the hard thing with that is we often learn a wrong belief that unless I get aggressive, unless I leave, nobody would actually respect my boundaries. So we don't try to set boundaries. We just assume that I have to get mad, I have to blow up, or I have to get out of the situation because that's the only way that I can have space. Um, so let's look at a more in-depth definition of boundaries. So boundaries are the rules and guidelines that we need to be healthy in all areas of life, physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual. So we are uh, not just a physical body or a mind, but we are all these things. We are a spirit, we have a body, we have a mind, we interact, so we have a social aspect to ourselves. Um, and all these things need boundaries around them to be healthy. So in other words, we can have good boundaries in one area, but say if our boundaries are unhealthy in another area, then often that area is still going to affect us. Uh, boundaries operate on several core beliefs. So we need a few beliefs uh, to be able to set boundaries. The very first most simple one is that I am a valuable person and deserve to have my needs met. And that's why I think it's actually great that this talk followed the shame talk, because in the shame talk we looked at, you know, how do you get the idea that you're actually not valuable? And if you don't deal with that core belief that you're not valuable, you're not going to feel like uh, it, people need to treat me a certain way. You're not going to feel like, you know what, I can ask for things. Uh, so that's really important, knowing that it's okay for me to ask for things. Often children who didn't get their needs met grew up thinking that my needs must have just not been that important if no one met them. Uh, the next core belief is I am responsible to create a healthy life. And that's an important one because we have to realize that even if other people hurt us, we're the only ones that can get healthy now. So often sometimes we, you know, can get stuck on sort of blaming people or that sort of thing. And the reality is that uh, we can overcome, we can get healthy, and we can take steps to do that. Uh, the next one is similar to that. I am capable of making powerful choices. So if we realize that I'm a powerful person, as an adult, I can make choices that change the course of my life. 
then we're going to feel like we can set boundaries, like this can have an effect and this can move us forward. If we feel like, you know, we're weak and we don't have any power, often even if something's hurting us, we won't bother trying to set a boundary, we'll just stay in the situation because we don't know how to get out. Uh, sometimes we need people to help us reclaim our power and to show us how to be powerful. Uh, the next one is, other people cannot be expected to know what I need or make me healthy. This is a big one. Uh, so if we're expecting someone else to, you know, read our mind, to understand what we're feeling, etc., often uh, we get disappointed, we can get angry, we can have unmet expectations. You know, so we have to be realistic and understand that if we have certain issues in our life, no one's going to know what boundaries we need. We have to set those, we have to communicate these things, we have to talk to people, and that will ensure that our boundaries get met. So we're going to give some examples of practical boundaries. Uh, and this is just an overview, so there's lots more than this, but some examples for recovery. So if you're recovering from an addiction, uh, one example is safety, right? Avoiding certain people, places, and things. So we talk about different things that can be triggers. Uh, triggers are unique to people. So one thing that could trigger someone to someone else, that means nothing. Um, and also, you know, there's different things that people can do to deal with triggers. Uh, we have an example here of giving someone your bank card. So, you know, if money was a trigger, we could work around that. Uh, another thing about recovery is putting boundaries around our morals. That say, if we have morals of being honest and reliable and trustworthy, we can do things to put boundaries around this. Uh, this is important because uh, often in the problem, say addiction takes our morals away. Addiction causes us to elevate pleasure above our morals um, and often puts us back um, into our limbic brain, which can uh, cause us not to make good decisions. Uh, also for recovery, we often have to be healthy physically. So this looks like eating healthy, sleeping, uh, getting the sleep we need, or sorry, uh, self-care, uh, exercise, things like this. So those things can help our body heal from the effects of addiction. We also have to be healthy emotionally. Um, and things can help like journaling, talking about how we're doing, being free to laugh and cry. It's interesting that sometimes our boundaries don't just need to, again, push things out, but actually um, expand to let things in. So some of us were taught growing up that expressing emotion wasn't healthy. And sometimes we need to expand our boundary to include more emotions than we were allowed growing up, such as expressing pain, fear, loneliness, rejection, these type of things. Um, often, if we're not allowed to do that, uh, it all comes out as anger or numbness. Uh, the last thing here is that we need to be healthy spiritually. And this, again, can look different for different people. Uh, we have up here praying, meditating, reading, time in the morning. And the reality is that having a healthy spiritual life doesn't just happen. A lot of times we think that if we just have a belief, then we're fine, you know, or that just takes care of itself. But the reality is we need to be intentional about carving out time, you know, to be healthy spiritually and to work on that. Uh, another thing here we have is raising a child. Uh, so for those of you who are parents, uh, shout out to you, uh, there's a lot that you need to know about uh, setting boundaries with children. It's a, it's a huge topic. Uh, there's lots around it, so I'm just barely going to scratch the surface. But the reality is that if kids are going to mature and learn how to make positive choices as adults, they need to have boundaries to, in order to learn how to do that. So examples of boundaries that parents would set is around safety. So for example, you know, not going on the street alone, uh, not talking to strangers, you know, um, even I think a huge area for safety for a parent is who do you allow into your home where that is your sacred space for your child? Who do you allow to influence your child's life? You know, what do you allow your child to watch? Things like that. Even keeping children health healthy physically, like giving them a bedtime, helping them eat healthy, regulating uh, their screen time. It's interesting how there's so many um, experiments and studies and whatever on the effect of screen time on kids and even social media and how that affects them. So uh, the reality is if we don't set boundaries with kids, often they'll, you know, stay up all night watching cartoons, eating ice cream every day, which, you know, could be fun, but wouldn't contribute well later in life. Uh, even teaching kids how to treat others and let others treat them is super important for setting boundaries. So even if you have siblings saying, what is allowed? Are they allowed to 
um, you know, yell at each other? Are they allowed to punch? Are they allowed to steal things, etc.? cetera? Um, but a big thing about this one is that we can tell kids how other people can treat them, but if we're letting people hurt us and we're not setting boundaries, often our kids are learning from us. They're watching us. So it's really important that as we tell that kid, hey, you know, you're valuable. Uh, this is what people are allowed to do in your life. This is what they're not allowed to do. We want to make sure that we're also upholding those same boundaries so they see those in action in our life. Um, another one is teaching them to be responsible, so cleaning their room, doing chores, etc. Some kids don't like to do chores, some are all maybe. Uh, and sometimes we could feel, that parent could feel a little bit mean or, you know, I don't know, you know. Uh, but the reality is that if they don't learn these things, they're not going to be as successful later. Um, so each new rule uh, is a boundary that can teach them how to have a healthy life. So we're going to talk about two categories of boundaries now. One of those is internal boundaries. So those mean boundaries that we set around ourselves and our own life. Uh, what we will make ourselves do and what we will not allow ourselves to do. And internal boundaries require self-discipline. So for example, um, if you want to go to the gym three times a week uh, and then you feel the laziness encroaching on your gym boundary or your gym rule, you know, sometimes it takes a self-discipline to put your foot down and say, I'm going to do this regardless of, you know, uh, what's happening here. Uh, the other thing is that we often need to develop life skills that can help us have boundaries. So say, for example, if we've never had boundaries around our money, we might need to, say, take a budgeting class or explore some financial counseling so that we can learn how to have those boundaries if that was never something that we were taught. Even time management really is a skill that sometimes we actually have to be taught. Um, as far as external boundaries, this is what we won't do to others and what we won't allow others to do to us. So we have to have boundaries with other people. Um, and there's a couple of things we have to know before we do that. One is that we can't expect everyone to know what we need or have the right motives. So sometimes, um, some of us could be naive sometimes and think that, hey, everybody, if I meet someone, they seem good, they must have the right motives. And we get hurt and disappointed when they don't because we let the relationship happen too quickly. Um, sometimes uh, we're really surprised and angry if someone tries to manipulate us and we think, how could they do that? You know, don't they care? Why would they be like that? And the reality is, rather than being surprised when it happens, we need to prepare for all types of manipulation. So I actually help people uh, become immune, in a sense, to manipulation so that they have the skills to say, hey, you know, this is what's going on. Uh, this is what you're doing. And, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So you can stay calm and you can stay relaxed if you know that none of the tactics that someone's going to bring against you um, are going to work. Uh, so we have to learn a lot of skills for assertiveness and communication and conflict resolution to actually be able to set boundaries. And sometimes it really is just a lack of those communication skills that prevents us. Uh, so boundaries protect us from harm. So if you see this, uh, no one would say to themselves, I really just wish those guardrails were gone. Like, those are so annoying. Just take them away. You know, no one would say that, right? Because there's cliff, scary stuff. Um, so the reality is... Uh, Boundaries keep us from getting seriously hurt. And it's interesting because sometimes we have a misunderstanding of freedom. We can think freedom is being able to do whatever you want all the time. That's freedom, right? Uh, the reality is I've worked in the addictions field for a long time. And one thing I noticed was there were some people who did just that. They said, I'm going to have as much meth as I want. I'm going to sleep around as much as I want. I'm going to make as much money as possible. And those people eventually would come to us as some of the most uh, empty and broken people that we're in the most pain, the most emotional pain. They would say, this didn't make me happy. It was so unfulfilling. And the reality is that I define freedom um, as the ability to choose the best option in our lives every time. So sometimes if the best option is recovery, then freedom means being able to choose recovery, right? If the best option is loving our kids, freedom is the ability to do that without being enslaved to something like addiction, right? So addiction actually enslaves us. It doesn't actually give us any freedom. Um, and if we don't do that, we often experience painful consequences, and often it's not worth it. And those consequences are there to teach us, hey, this is the road. This is the path. Walk in it. So we should learn from those consequences and say, hey, we don't have to repeat this. We can do something different. Uh, when it comes to external boundaries, we need to know that we can be in charge of how close people get to us. Sometimes people feel like relationships just happen, um, or someone just walked in over my boundaries and there they were, you know. Um, the reality is that we have to, at every step, you know, set uh, the limit with people as far as how close can they get. Uh, we also have to limit their access to us. 
So the closest people to us should have the most of our resources, and as we get further away, um, they should have less resources. Uh, so that way, you know, we're in control of that. I've had people come to me saying, you know, um, so many people asked me for money this week, now I'm broke. You know, <laughs> and I've had to say, you know, let's look at how much money do you have to give, and let's look at helping you uh, limit, you know, that option for people. Um, so we need to have beliefs to also have boundaries with other people. One belief is that I am not responsible for other people's actions or behaviors. So for example, if I set a boundary with someone and they go out and use, um, that's not my fault. I know that I'm not responsible for that. Now, they could feel hurt by something I do, and you know, in a sense, I might want to make that different, but the reality is if someone takes an action, um, we don't have to take the blame or, or feel guilty about that. Uh, another good example is anger. Often people feel like, I don't have an anger problem, there's just stupid people around, right? Um, <laughs> the reality is that, you know, if you punch a wall or you have an action, that's you, right? <laughs> that's not the stupid people punching the wall, that's, that's on you, right? So uh, often we're quick to kind of throw it back on someone else, and the reality is that our actions, our behaviors, our choices are us. Uh, the other thing is that we have to believe to set boundaries that other adults are powerful, resilient people that are capable of growing and maturing. Uh, often, if we see someone as a poor, pitiful person that we have to stoop in and rescue and save because they couldn't possibly survive without us, it's going to be very hard to set boundaries. The guilt will basically typically kill us and then we'll just give in, right? But if I see someone as, you know what, you can overcome this. You can get through this. Uh, you can grow past this. I'm going to be able to set up a boundary. Um, even with anger, if I think that this person can never learn to be better than this, I might make excuses for them. I might cover for them, as opposed to saying, I think you're capable of more. That actually empowers someone and actually gives them dignity. Uh, so that's really important. Another core belief is that we're not mean or bad just because someone else is upset. So sometimes we think, if someone else is mad at us, that means we've become bad. We uh, go into a shame reaction. So often parents can blame children, like, you made me upset. You made me anxious. You made me this. And so as soon as in a conversation someone starts getting upset, we think that we have to drop our boundaries to fix it. Uh, the reality is I had a very good quote from someone uh, who talked to me and helped me through setting my own boundaries, and they said, feel guilty and do it anyways. Uh, if you're super empathetic, you just will feel guilty. So just accept that. Be like, the guilt is going to be part of this, and I'm going to feel the feeling, and I'm still going through with my boundary. Uh, the last one is that I don't need people to like me to feel good about myself. So if you think that uh, I need someone's approval to survive, I need someone's approval to love myself, to accept myself, you won't be able to set a boundary with them. If you're still hanging on. So often we have adults that you know could be um, late into adulthood and still aren't able to set boundaries with their parents because even though they've grown up, they're still wanting that approval. They're still, in want, still wanting that love. And so when the parent is hurting them, they're not able to say, you know, I'm not going to accept this because there's that fear of losing the relationship. This often happens in partner relationships too, right? Where there's that fear, if I set a boundary, they might leave. And sometimes we have to look at how do we survive that? How can we cope? And to know that we're also strong, resilient people. And we're also capable of growing and changing. Um, all right. So if we had stricter abusive parents, uh, we tend to resist and rebel against any type of authority. Um, even if that person cares about us. So that's an interesting thing that happens is that often if parents were very strict about boundaries, uh, some parents had no boundaries, some had way too many boundaries, uh, then often we just, we're like, uh, rules, you know, and we kind of run from that. So the tricky thing is that sometimes if we had unhealthy authority and then someone tries to give us a feedback, um, we start to um, move away to reject that feedback. So part of it is becoming open to receive feed feedback, becoming open to healthy people in our lives that would actually share with us. Because sometimes people have so many boundaries that they don't actually even let a healthy person in. So sometimes uh, we actually have to remove a couple of boundaries so that we can have healthy people in our lives. Um, the other thing is that a lack of boundaries creates actually insecurity. So if people don't know where the boundaries are, they tend to actually not feel safe. Uh, there was an interesting experiment where there were kids in a school and they basically said, you know what, we're going to be super progressive and we're going to take all the fences away because we don't want these kids feeling like caged animals. This will be great. Um, everyone probably knows where this is going already. But anyways, so uh, they took the fences away and what happened was all the kids in the schoolyard played right in the middle. 
they didn't play with the structures on the side. They didn't play soccer with their friends. They were like huddled in the middle of the schoolyard and they said, well, this is really odd. You know, we wanted to make them free to roam around and here they're all, you know, uh, hiding here. So they actually decided to put the fences back up. And then what happened is kids would play right to the edge. They'd play soccer, they'd use the structures, they'd play everywhere because there was a safety in having that boundary. So the reality is that boundaries actually make people feel safe. Often people resist them at first, but if there are no boundaries, people feel floundered. They feel confused. They don't know where the limit is and they don't feel safe. On the other hand, children often test boundaries to make sure they haven't moved, right? Is the fence still here? You know, I'm gonna poke it every once in a while to see if it's there. Um, and so the reality is if we're setting boundaries with people, we have to be consistent. We can't set a boundary one day and change it the next day or else often uh, people learn that our boundaries um, aren't real, they're flexible, and that's not something we want. Um, so children need to be given consequences when they're young. Uh, if children don't get consequences when they're young, then often they grow up thinking that their actions don't have consequences. And the sad thing is sometimes jail is the first consequence that someone really experiences to their actions. Or, you know, they end up um, in a program, they end up with charges or something like that because no one told them, hey, this is wrong. No one told them, hey, this could lead to a bad place or you're hurting yourself, right? So sometimes uh, if no one's able to do that, um, they have to learn a much harder way later. Uh, so to refine our definition, we're gonna talk about a few components. Uh, so we have express morals. So these are values that we live by and these are things that we wanna have as non-negotiables. So we hold on to these no matter what. And if we have certain values and morals in our life, it's really important that we're careful around people who wanna take down our morals. So in other words, if I wanna be an honest person, a faithful person, and someone's encouraging me to leave that, um, I need to put up some boundaries right off the bat. If I am trying to recover and someone's you know, trying to drag me back into some criminal activity or something like that, or say, we'll just drink a little bit, or you know, it won't be a big deal, we often have to put boundaries. Uh, so these cover all sorts of things, uh, which I won't get into all of them. Uh, another thing is that we have uh, preferences and comfort zones. So everyone has different preferences. And these are things that we can express to people, we can communicate our needs, um, and they're all gonna be different. Um, but the reality is that uh, we can sometimes bend them a little. So say for example, uh, one thing in marriage we talk about, uh, or in relationships, we talk about love languages. So some people like physical touch, some people prefer to have words of affirmation. Um, uh, in marriage you might have issues like who does what chores, you know, who does the cat litter, who, uh, you know, cleans the bathroom, all this kind of stuff. And this is preference, right? So. Uh, often, with these sorts of issues, it's about coming to a compromise, respecting what both people think, and finding a midway point. Uh, the last one is personal safety. So sometimes something uh, might be okay for someone else, but not for me. So it's not necessarily moral issues, but they're things that we might need to set just because personally, uh, they can be hard for us. So one is social media, um, watching the news. Um, I personally like watching the news, but every once in a while I have to take a break. Uh, same with social media, you know, uh, how much can we volunteer? Uh, going to a family gathering, you know, say where there's alcohol might be okay for someone, maybe not for someone else. Even taking on new projects. So there are things like that where even though they're not moral issues, we need to know how much can I handle, right? How much am I capable of without burning out? And so if we take on way too many projects, even though those projects are great, uh, at the end of the day, we can be left exhausted. Just like if we do so many social activities all the time, uh, that can burn us out. Uh, we also have boundaries around what I will do for others. Uh, so if you're in a helping position, uh, it's really important to say, where is the line here? And uh, there's a quote from Henry Cloud, Henry Cloud, sorry, which I like, which is, is your helping helping? In other words, sometimes we have to just evaluate our helping. Is it, is it useful? Is it not? Um, examples are, do you lend money? Uh, what situations do you lend money? Who do you lend money to? Uh, giving people a ride, giving them cigarettes. Um, cigarettes are a funny one, typically in rehabs, uh, comes up a lot. Uh, you know, giving people your phone number, going out for coffee, you know, all these sort of things. Um, and it's really important that we look at our motives, right? Am I getting all of my significance from helping people? And if that's the case, it's important that we have a stable sense of significance outside of that, that we know that uh, we matter outside of that. Uh, the other thing is that if we keep giving and rescuing people without any boundaries, we actually keep people weak and immature. So in other words, if I keep paying someone's rent, even though uh, they could hypothetically 
uh, find a way to do it or find some other resources, I actually prevent them from learning how to problem solve. I prevent them from learning how to take that on themselves. So sometimes it's good to teach people skills, uh, to resource them, to help motivate and encourage them and tell them, you know what, you can do this. I'm going to be here to support you, but you got this. Um, and find ways to fill their needs other than just, you know, giving them handouts. Um, if we don't do that, often people, you know, start out really strong and they end up feeling used, they get resentful, and they feel like a victim again. So if you're feeling like a victim because of your helping, because you're giving out things, uh, it's important to look at that and say, rather than resenting these people, what can I do differently so I don't feel this way at the end? Um, in order to do this, we need to be honest and really self-aware. Uh, because uh, we need to know what are my skills, what are my giftings, uh, what is my maturity level, uh, how do I know when I'm getting burnt out. So we often talk about self-awareness, and one thing is to know the signs of when you're giving too much. You know, is it that you have trouble sleeping? Is it that you're eating too much or too little? Are you isolating? Are you getting irritable? So there's different things that we can know to ask ourselves. Do we have the slides? Okay. Uh, somehow I can't read my screen, but that's okay. Um, okay, so we are going to talk about uh, boundaries in the Bible. So what does God have to do with boundaries? Uh, it's really interesting. One time I had a client come up to me and be like, are boundaries even in the Bible? Like, what are you guys teaching? And so I thought, hmm, I should really look into that. That seems important. Uh, so uh, the Bible has many boundaries, actually, that help us live a healthy life. Uh, so they're all over the place. Uh, they explain to us how to be intimate with ourselves, how to be intimate with others, um, and how to be intimate with God so that we can live the best and most satisfying life possible. Um, however, people often misrepresent God uh, as somebody who is an angry tyrant with lots of rules so we don't have any fun. You know, as long as you're not having fun, it's okay. Um, and so we often, you know... Uh, you know, grew up in a church or, you know, heard from parents or, you know, grandparents that, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And we concluded that that's clearly all God's agenda is to basically restrict us. Uh, the other thing is that often we see God through the lens of unhealthy authority figures. So in other words, if we had a dad that was distant, that was cold, uh, we might see God as someone who's way out there, he's not approachable, we can't know him. Uh, if we had a dad who was angry, who would react, you know, we might see God as kind of a threatening, intimidating person who could lash out and get us any time. So really the parents that we had often create uh, a lens through which we look at God, and that lens can be distorted. And also people in the church sometimes can hurt us. Uh, they can use their power to abuse us, and that can create an unhealthy view that God is not safe and that he will not protect us. So right off the bat, it's important that we actually address this stuff. I actually encourage people if they have issues of spiritual abuse or um, ways that they feel they've been hurt by God to even get help, get counseling around that because that can pre prevent us from getting one of the most powerful resources in our life. Um, so also sometimes we think that God expects perfection, that he's a perfectionist and he doesn't see effort. Uh, and if we don't get it right the first time, he's very impatient. So these are things that we can come to uh, the Bible with and that can um, prevent us from taking, you know, the truth, the gold from that and actually using it to better our lives. Uh, so we need to know someone's character in order to trust them. We know that we really shouldn't trust someone if they don't have character. So what about God? Uh, so in 1 John 4, 8, the Bible states that God is love. This means that love is his defining character. So God has other character traits. He's powerful. He's just. He's righteous. But it's interesting that the Bible uses this one as the ultimate definition. So even when God is acting in justice, this is through the filter of love. Even when he's showing his power, it's through love. It's not apart from love. Uh, the other thing it says is that uh, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Uh, I looked up in a commentary about what the light and the darkness were referencing, and for light it said wisdom, knowledge, holiness, and happiness, and for darkness it said ignorance, imperfection, sinfulness, and misery. So light signifies truth. When you turn a light on in a room, you know it's there. It also exposes things. Um, it cleans, cleanses things. Light is also healing. It's interesting we get radiation therapy because light can actually uh, heal. 
Uh, and of course, the darkness is the opposite. So if we know that there's no corruption in God, uh, often in human hearts, even you know the best people have a tiny bit of darkness at least, right? But we know that uh, God is perfect and we can trust his character. So what are God's boundaries? Um, our top two priorities, according to the Bible, are to love God and love others. So in other words, if those are the two priorities, those are things we actually need boundaries around. Um, and anything else that is untrue and unjust, you know, all these other qualities also have boundaries. So just as an example of how this is taught, God tells us to be patient, kind to one another, to care for the poor, uh, to discipline people who are hurting or taking advantage of others, uh, to advocate for the oppressed. So he sets boundaries around things that are unjust, you know, unloving, unkind, so that we can all be safe, so that we can feel secure uh, in our relationships with each other. Uh, we also can put boundaries around our worship of God. So the Bible says that, you know, to have no other gods above him. And we can easily uh, put things before God without realizing. So often, codependence happens when we put a person before God. And we make that person our sole source of emotional support, of love, of meaning, um, etc. Uh, we can also put things like money before God. We can chase money, power, fame, you know, promotions, um, traveling. Um, I like traveling, so go watch that one. <laughs> you know, whatever, chocolate, it's all good. Anything can become something we put before God. So we have to have boundaries around that. So what is God's plan? So God's plan is to restore our connection with each other and with him and to heal the land. It actually talks about all three of those things. Uh, and it says that often if we do the first two things, the land will heal, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, but as part of God's plan, we all have a part to play. It says that we're uniquely designed and created. And it says uh, in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, God has created a unique plan for each one of us. And that's really important. And what we can do is seek God's will, try to find out what his will is, and then say no to anything that takes us off that path. Uh, so often, we have to put boundaries around things like temptation. Uh, things can come to tempt us away from God's plan. Often, other people can judge God's plan for us. They can think, why are you going on that missions trip? Why are you working for that organization? You should be trying to make money. You should be saving for retirement. Uh, you should be marrying this person. You know, often, if we feel called to something, someone is going to come along and say that that's not the right thing for us. Um, so it's important that we're able to resist that. So what about Jesus? Because in the Bible, Jesus is our role model. He's supposed to uh, be a person that lived his life out perfectly that we can look to. So did Jesus have boundaries? Uh, it's interesting because I had someone come to me and say, I can't have boundaries because Jesus was a martyr and I'm supposed to be like Jesus. Uh, so uh, I had to clear that up and say, you know what, even though Jesus was a martyr, he said, I choose to give my life. So he knew that that was a choice he wanted to do because he wanted to fulfill God's will. It wasn't something where he uh, felt like it was taken from him. So let's look at his boundaries. First, he had a boundary around his relationship with God. So Mark 1.35 says uh, that Jesus got up early before the sun rose and went alone to pray. So Jesus is like most of us in his day, where if you wait, uh, we get really busy right? We got stuff to do. We're running around, you know. Um, and often if we don't prioritize uh, that time with him, it just kind of slips away. So often we have to set a boundary to maybe sometimes lose a bit of sleep or lose a bit of quiet time in the evening or something uh, to be with him. Uh, Jesus also gave people in his life different levels of access to him. So not everyone was allowed the same access. So for example, first he had uh, the crowds. So when he would go to a city, a crowd would gather and they would all hear him. He would say a message and they would hear it. And then he would leave to another city, right? So that's one level of access. They'd hear him preach from a distance and that was it. Then Jesus had followers. So this was uh, several hundred people. Uh, they would follow him around. Sometimes they'd even provide food for him, things like that. Uh, and they would hear more of these messages because they would be, you know, following him from city to city. However, Jesus then t chose 12 people to be his disciples, and these people he invested in more. They were like a tight-knit group, you know, like the people he picked as his personal volunteers or employees or band to say, okay, I'm going to work more closely with these people. But then Jesus had three closest friends, and these were his intimate companions. So when he went to do something that was, you know, um, kind of private, kind of intimate, 
um, an experience that maybe not everybody would understand. He took his three closest friends. Uh, so the reality is different people had different levels of access. They weren't all the same. Uh, the other thing is that when God would call Jesus to a new place, uh, Jesus would have to leave needy people behind. So it actually says that people would beg him to stay because he was healing everybody, doing great stuff, and he would tell them, I have to go because that's what God has called me to do. I have to get this message out to more people. And those people were probably feeling a little bit hurt, like we wish you would not leave. <laughs> we'll hog you, you know, uh, and that's okay with us. But, you know, Jesus was very clear that this is not why I was sent to just stay here. I have to go everywhere uh, to share the good news. Um, the other thing is that Jesus actually um, not only went around to other places, but chose to go to the cross, uh, even though his closest friends actually said, we really don't like this idea. You know, uh, we really don't think you should die. Do something else. Uh, and he had to say, no, I'm drawing a line. I'm drawing a boundary. This is what I've been asked to do. Even if you don't approve, I'm still going to do it. So that's the kind of resolve sometimes that we have to have as well. So... Uh, the other thing Jesus did is he used the Bible to create a boundary around his truth. So it's interesting because there's a, a time in the Bible where Satan comes to tempt Jesus and he says, you know, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this to deny God. And what does Jesus do? He brings the Bible, he brings scripture to say, um, this is why that's not a good idea. This is why I'm not going to do that. And so he used that to protect his mind against lies. Just like we can actually use the Bible to protect our minds. Um, so Jesus used the boundaries to protect love and also his ultimate plan for his life. So there's lots of times where people were acting unloving and Jesus actually set a boundary. And the other thing is that when religious leaders were being hypocritical, Jesus often called them out because he wanted to protect the integrity of God's house. So it's interesting because sometimes we feel like, you know, if God was good, then his people would also be good. But the reality is, even in Jesus' time, there were hypocrites, and he was taking a stand against that. He was saying, that's not okay, and on my watch, I'm going to call that out. So what kind of boundaries can we have as a result? Um, for one thing, when it comes to God, I think we can set a boundary around our identity. Uh, so the Bible says that we are children of God. Uh, there's a really interesting verse that, you know, stuck out to me a long time ago that said, even if my mother and father reject me, the Lord will accept me as his child. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, if you're into tattoos, you know that uh, tattooing your palm is really um, an intense and sacred thing. Often people don't do it, but it actually says that he's tattooed our name on the palm of his hands, that, you know, we're always before him, we're always on his mind. And so if we know those things, and then a lie comes in from shame, and it says, you're not good enough, you're not valuable, nobody cares. Um, and if we have this word of the truth, we can say, no, God cares. If you feel like, I shouldn't feel this way, you know, I'm too broken, I'm too stuck, you know, we can take the Bible and pull up a verse that says the Lord has compassion and he's close to the brokenhearted, right? And that he doesn't just see a messed up person. He says, I want to invest in this, that uh, you're mine. Um, so the other thing is that we sometimes need to ask ourselves questions and just take a little bit of time to evaluate. So I've left a couple of questions here, and I'm just going to go through them. And one question is, what boundaries do we need in our lives to put God first? What's getting in the way? For some, it might be that, you know, we just want to zone out and watch TV after work. For some, it might be that, you know, um, we just haven't really picked a place to, you know, go for church or something like that. It can be different for everybody. Um, it doesn't even have to look like a church. Um, but we, there's all sorts of ways that we can start to build that into our life. Uh, the next thing is, what boundaries do we need to make love a priority? So if God said that love is his top priority and we allow things in our heart like hatred, resentment, bitterness, selfishness, these things crowd out love. Um, I was talking to someone recently about how, you know, if they have hatred towards someone else from their past, um, the problem is they carry that into every relationship they have now. So even if they don't hate people now, that hatred is all they have to give. So often if we get rid of, you know, these other feelings, we're a healthy person to give someone else love, to give someone else kindness and goodness. Uh, the last one is how can we speak the truth in love to those who might push against your boundaries? And this is an actual phrase in the Bible. And what I love about it is that truth and love can go together. So when we set a boundary with someone, we don't want to hurt them. We don't want to be aggressive. We don't want to put them down. We want to be truthful, but we want to make sure that our truth towards them is wrapped in love so that while we're giving them a truth, they can feel loved. And 
that's the end of that. So I'll let you guys think about that and hope you grow. And I'm just going to say a prayer for us all to be able to uh, grow in this thing of boundaries. And it's interesting because in my own life, I would say that I probably didn't learn how to set boundaries until I was an adult. And even now, I feel like I'm constantly learning um, just a little bit better how to set boundaries. So I think this is one of those things that we're always in the process, we're always growing. So don't beat yourself up if you try and you fail. Uh, just keep at it, and we can ask God now for strength.